<sighs> Maybe we begin by taking what could be our first intentional breath of the day, just letting ourselves fully arrive here. This evening, we're gonna focus on breath. We're really gonna come back to those essential basics of mindfulness of breathing. And for some of you, that's like, yay, a delight, mindfulness of breathing, my favorite. And for others, it's like, oh God, that's so boring, it's so hard. So wherever you currently sit in relationship to mindfulness of breathing, I hope you find something tonight that really kind of captures your excitement and your passion. Because to really focus on the breath, it's, it's to actually find a way to fall in love with this really simple practice of focusing on the breath. Some of you uh, I know, some of you I don't know. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Maybe it's your first night at the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And of course, I know there are some friends here who we've been holding space together through this online time for a while. So just wanna extend Firstly, just so much gratitude for you all showing up here together, doing this practice live together, doing this practice in our virtual space. It matters so much. We can all listen to recordings anytime. That's awesome. How lucky are we that just some of the greatest teachings ever known are right available to us pretty much anytime. But what it means to show up here together is different. It means that we are valuing the benefit of Sangha of community. And so this evening I will <clears throat> be asking us to engage mostly through the chat. And of course, part of engagement means that we get to bring our practice of Dharma right into that invaluable aspect of our body, our speech and our mind. And of course, in this case, it's more our body from, you know, the, the chest up, or maybe the, you know, image you have on your, um, your Zoom holder place screen. Your speech may actually just mean what you're writing in the chat, but I also invite you to really focus on your inner speech as well as we're here together and in your mind. And the invitation this evening is that we come together with just the utmost respect for the Sangha, for one another. That we come together with the utmost respect to honor our ethic of non-harming both to ourself and to others. So we're kind of switching gears here. We're moving now into a mode of respect and non-harming. Do you feel it? I hope so. It starts with you. It starts with feeling that sense really deep in yourself. And of course, extending it to our time here together. As many of you know who <clears throat> regularly attend and support the Dharma Collective, it is, it is an aspiration and goal of us as a community to create a space of welcoming and a space where we hope that people can have a sense of refuge. It would make, nothing would make us happier than if you let us know ways we can improve. So please feel free to reach out to Noam or to Mace uh, or myself if that felt comfortable and just let us know any ways that we can continue to create and facilitate a space where we can do this beautiful work together. So I am Eve Ekman, as might have been mentioned, very fortunate to be a teacher here with the Dharma Collective. And I try to bring a bit of a mixture of my deep love of these Buddhist practices alongside the contemplative science. And when we're tonight gonna to be focusing on the breath, I'll admit part of my motivation is just the incredible amount of research on the benefits of breath in and of itself just the ways that we can attend to our breath. And some of the ways that we notice attending to the breath being of benefit is it actually helps us slow down some of our habitual tendencies. When we focus on the breath, we're doing something quite unnatural. We're bringing conscious awareness to something we need no conscious awareness for. As we all know, if we had to think about breathing, we'd all probably die. We just forget and <laughs> stop breathing. Fortunate for us, not a requirement. And so it's really interesting to bring conscious attention to something 
that doesn't need our conscious attention. And some of the suggested hypotheses as to why this simple practice of bringing attention to our breath is so powerful is in some ways we're kind of decoupling automaticity, right? Habit from an experience in which instead we bring kind of conscious awareness or full presence. And these ideas are so abstract, conscious awareness, full presence. Often you'll hear myself say loving presence. And I think focusing on the breath, it really gives us this simple tactile way to practice presence, to practice attention, and to practice this fundamental tool of bringing conscious awareness to places we often fall asleep. And not literally, of course, we do fall asleep breathing, but we fall asleep into habit. We get caught up in the same old ways of being again and again. How do we kind of break or cut through that habit? We can start if, you know, if we feel brave right in the midst of our sticky habits. Like tomorrow, I'm going to stop judging people. I would commend that, right? Because most of us, we're not even aware that we're judging as already that judging mind has just made its way through the morning news and your first emails um, and whatever else is, is coming across your field of awareness. So I really think that focusing as we can with a breath as a first and really important step in developing conscious present awareness to our daily experience. It's incomparable, such an amazing training ground. A couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> I re-listened to one of my favorite teachings on the breath by Alan Wallace, who is a teacher you, you hear Chandra and I speak of often. He is a um, yeah, wonderful scholar and teacher of Tibetan Buddhism who I'd say one of his many meaningful and beneficial crusades is for us to learn deeply focus and attention, for us to learn shamatha. And he has a teaching on the breath, uh, his shamatha teaching on the breath just got me so re-excited about breath all over again. And I want to, I'm sorry I'm talking so much, we are gonna practice, but I want to give a little bit of front-loading to this breath practice give us the best possible opportunity to really take advantage of these pith teachings. So in this practice of breathing, we're gonna start quite simply. And the simple way that we start, which is true definitely for almost any meditation, but very true for the text that we're making our way through of, of the Lojong, is we arouse bodhicitta. And we will do that together, but giving ourselves a moment here to reflect on, on what, it, what does it mean to arouse bodhicitta? For some of you who are practitioners, there might be almost this Pavlovian response. You hear arouse bodhicitta and your heart just stirs. And if that's not as familiar of a term, bodhicitta really means how do we open our heart? How do we open and tenderize our heart to the enormous need, the great suffering of this world. And we do so joyously and fully. And when we arouse bodhicitta in a practice, it means that every single breath, every single distraction, every single moment of our practice is dedicated to that. So that's our very first part of practice that we will enter into. And then we, as a first part of practice, we try, we'll do this many times throughout the practice, but we try, let's just release our attention. We will come into this kind of sense of, okay, here's the first time I get to release everything. And it's a simple and preliminary step. And if you're um, like myself, you know, you have a, a teacher you pay close attention to. So I've listened to hundreds of meditations by Alan, I, probably a more than a thousand over the last 11 years. And um, he always has this very simple and important formula for us, arousing bodhicitta, bringing our awareness down, loosening and relaxing, and then settling 
our body, our speech, and our mind in our natural states. Sometimes he'll just say that one sentence, settle your body, speech, and mind in its natural states. It's profound. You'll find it across many Tibetan traditions and bond tradition as well. But when we settle the body, we're really looking for this quality of stillness. So even now, not meditating, for a moment, we can kind of touch that stillness of the body. And it's as though it prepares our mind, prepares our heart for that stillness. And when we settle the speech, things start to get a bit more, I would say, interesting. Because the speech is that internal narrative and dialogue. I bet all of us could probably come up with at least 12 characters who are going through our mind in every, any given 20 or 30 minute period. There's like the coach, like, yeah, you're doing great. There's the critic, like, why are you thinking about that again? The planner, right? Like all of these different voices. And they all, of course, have some really important messages for us. Sometimes they are life-saving. Sometimes they make us feel <laughs> overwhelmed, but we try to turn down the volume. And the way we do so is not by kind of internally shushing ourselves. We actually turn down the volume by focusing on the natural rhythm of the breath. And that's where we really start to focus most of our breathing practice. So the first instructions will be this kind of natural rhythm of the breath, just noticing that. And when we do so, we're actually inviting ourselves to let go of anything else in the way. So not just turning down the narrative because it's, it's the right thing to do, but turning down that inner narration and inner narrative almost as an act of renunciation, letting go of worldly and mundane concerns so we can focus with this bodhicitta aspiration on the natural rhythm of the breath. And when we focus on the natural rhythm of the breath, really it's without any intervention. We just let the breath be completely natural. And then the next shift in our practice, then we get into some pith instructions from a sangha. And in those instructions, we focus primarily on the felt sensations of the entire body breathing. And again, many of you have heard this instruction many times. It's like, oh yeah, we're doing that preliminary thing. We're starting practice. But to really focus all the felt sensations, tactile sensations throughout the body associated with breathing. gives us this wonderful opportunity to start sharpening our attention. Just a bit more precision. Another part of this pith instruction that was actually, I think, given to a Sangha by the Buddha is when the breath is long, notice it is long. And when the breath is short, notice it is short. <clears throat> and if you're like me, the first many times I heard that practice, I was like, what, <laughs> what does that mean? And it invites this real subtle, intimate knowing that our breath is not always the same. Just like our embodied sensations, they're shifting and changing. So we don't forth, force an extra long breath. We don't try to shorten anything, but we just bring that attention to the duration of breaths and noticing. We'll then move into a, a final pith instruction with mindfulness of breathing. And this is from Padma Sambhava, my favorite instruction. You'll hear me use this one a lot, where we actually notice the oscillation of the breath as a way of being able to um, really tether our attention. So we notice the oscillation as the breath travels in through the inhale, and we invite a quality of kind of vividness and clarity. And we also notice the breath fully through the exhale, but we do so with ease. And so we're balancing breath by breath, 
these essential qualities of our meditative state, focus and clarity on the inhale, relaxation and ease on the exhale. So that is your roadmap. I hope for you all, it's meaningful to get just a bit of that preview. So interesting, you know, this, this capacity of our mind to rehearse. As I am speaking instructions to you, hopefully you're imagining them. And as you're imagining them, you're forging pathways. That process of actually bringing to mind what will happen. We'll see, it's an experiment. It often can really kind of strengthen our ability to fully show up. This is well known by athletes, well known by very successful business people who rehearse difficult experiences. So we are doing, let's hope it's not too difficult of an experience, but we're rehearsing something that might be a bit challenging. And the last thing I'll say before <clears throat> we begin our practice is it's challenging. Mindfulness of breathing is a very challenging practice. It's subtle. It's so easy to get caught up in distraction, to find ourselves kind of pulled away into the past, kind of adhering towards something desirable, even having a memory that creates a sense of aversion. Oof, I really hope that doesn't happen. It's a hard practice and one that can make us feel at times maybe a bit disheartened. So before we begin, just saying that it is absolutely a practice. One that we strengthen many, many, many times. One that maybe even in the course of our meditation tonight, you'll have moments of great clarity and feel like you are truly that horseman who is riding the breath. And other times you will get bucked off and completely caught up and that's okay. We'll just keep coming back and keep coming back. So with that huge preamble, Let's go ahead and find a posture that really supports our practice. Most importantly, an upright spine. <clears throat> and for many of us who are sitting a lot during the days, let's be kind and give ourselves just a small release by inhaling our shoulders up to our ears, exhaling them down our back. And twice more. Inhaling our shoulders up to our ears. And finding a position for the head <clears throat> to rest on top of the neck. Where the natural gaze, even under the eyelids, is just pointing somewhere directly in front of you. Inviting a slight lift in the chest upward. Finding a comfortable position for the hands to be resting either folded in the lap or on top of the thighs. Now beginning our practice by arousing bodhicitta. Reminding ourselves that we are here together in community. And our aspiration of course is to strengthen from within our compassion and our wisdom. And I invite you to find tonight a meaningful way to understand this motivation of being of service.
you could think of the specific qualities in which you would like to inhabit and show up for those immediately in your life. And even thinking of the bigger, greater change you'd like to influence throughout your lifetime. So a couple moments here, just noticing and reflecting on what naturally arises as you consider this dedication beyond your own well-being into this beautiful, beautiful web of interconnection. sharing the lines from the guide to the Bodhisattva way of life, which His Holiness the Dalai Lama shares that he re reflects on each morning. If they are meaningful for you, just let them land in your heart. May I be an island for those who need landfall. May I be a lamp for those needing light. May I be a bed for those who need rest. And for those who are sick and suffering, may I be both medicine and doctor. Allowing these intentions and aspirations to gently fall to the background. We take our first step in this practice of inviting our awareness to really sink to the ground. Feel a sense of deep relaxation and ease through the body. And continue inviting this ease in the body. And as we settle our body in its natural state, noticing qualities of stillness.
And shifting gently to settling our speech, the inner dialogue, all the words, ideas, images, all the plans. And doing so by focusing on the natural rhythm of the breath. So we focus on this natural rhythm of the breath. We continue to release all mundane and worldly concerns. Reminding ourselves of this aspiration of bodhicitta. How much work it will take to train our minds to continue to withstand and overcome challenges and obstacles inner and outer on this path of liberation. And with that renewed motivation, releasing all thoughts, memories and images and bringing the full force of our attention to noticing the natural rhythm of the breath. And noticing this natural breath through the tactile sensations of the body. Attending to each breath continuously through inhale and exhale, as though it were the most precious gift you could ever imagine receiving and the most precious gift you could ever imagine extending. Each time your mind gets caught up in distraction or fantasy, simply relax, release whatever has captured the attention and refresh your interest, noticing this natural rhythm of the breath through the tactile sensations throughout the body associated with breath.
And gently shifting, still noticing our natural rhythm of the breath while applying this more specific inquiry to notice when the breath is long and notice when the breath is short. This doesn't mean we become tight with noticing. Yet we become bright in our specificity, our closeness, our intimacy with the breath, knowing when it is long and knowing when it is short. This noticing as much as possible should be not discursive in any way. Not trying to analyze or understand the shortness or longness. Noticing the breath from within the breath. And applying one more method, deepening our understanding, our closeness with the breath. We invite this close and bright attention through the inhale, filling us, making us have a sense of uprightness and presence. And then using the exhale to release tension, to find ease. Through each oscillation, inhaling vividness, brightness, 
Exhaling, ease, relaxation. A couple more breaths here, finding that clarity through the inhale, ease, relaxation through the exhale. For the last couple minutes of practice, releasing this close and focused attention. And feel or imagine a sense of spaciousness and openness in the mind and the body. And rest in this spacious openness. And just before we bring this practice to a close, remembering our motivation and aspiration. Whatever we were able to deepen or explore in this practice, we dedicate it towards that aspiration. And gently wiggling fingers and toes. Let's blink our eyes back open together to our shared space. Thank you for your practice. 
It's interesting. Uh, it's been such a struggle, the online teaching, uh, as, as it is being an online student in other contexts. But I, I don't know, um, it was just my imagination, but I could feel you guys through that practice somehow. Something about like focusing on the breath and knowing we were all breathing. That was very sweet. Um, I'd love to hear any questions or any comments or reflections on that practice. You are welcome to share those in the chat, uh, or if you would like to um, raise your hand, that would also be great. Yes, Diane. Thank you, there's so much synergy. Um, I went to Tenzin Manuel Rinpoche's teaching this morning and each month, each week, he's each month he's focusing on something, and this month is is of the breath. Hmm. And he had a panel, and there's so much synergy, right? We're suffering from COVID, which attacks our our breathing. And George Floyd, mm -hmm. he was, they were choking him in a way that he couldn't breathe, and that. And then breathing is one of the three doors of Zogchen. And um, I just thought, and then I was at another, um, I go to a, another uh, support group, Recovery Dharma, and they were, they were talking about the breath this evening. So yeah, it's the, it, well, they, and they played a meditation too, that we can just ride that breath and it mm. just help how it helps us. And I just wanted to mention, I hope it's appropriate that, um, mm. He will be on a panel with Tenzin Wingo and Poche next month. And is it okay if I put the info in the chat? It's on sure. Facebook Live and these are yeah. awesome. So yeah. Anyway, thank you. This is so helpful. Thank you. Thank you for your reflection. And I'm I'm glad to hear of the synergy around breathing all around. Um, it is, you know, it's it's not a surprise, right? Breathing, it's pretty primary practice, but we can really fall away from it. We can think that uh Oh yeah, you know what, that breathing, I did that early on, now I've advanced. Now I'm doing something else. Uh, and I agree, you know, it's metaphoric significance in this time is, it's huge. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else, reflections or questions on that practice? Okay. Um, yeah, that was great. I really enjoyed that. I, um, I wanted to ask about cultivating bodhicitta. Mm. Um, I've noticed for me, so I've been following Michael Taft's meditations for a while, and he kind of got me into that rhythm of, uh, you know, setting that intention when you, as you get into your practice and then, um, and then now I've s sort of made that part of my practice and even part of my day you know when I mm. wake up it's kind of the first thing I I don't even know how it happened but it's just the first thing that my mind goes to now and uh, it's you know the last thing that my mind goes to before I go to sleep which honestly it's mm. been quite um, life-changing um, and yeah I'm you know just curious to hear more from others about how they go about cultivating it or how they express it how they, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Wow, thank you for sharing that. Um, that's beautiful to hear. And I think inspiring to think about, you know, beginning our day and ending the day. And <clears throat> what you're pointing to is the beautiful um, process of habit formation, which is when we start and something has a natural reward for us, it feels good or supports us, it becomes reflexive right? It's no longer something we have to try. We just n find ourselves naturally doing. Um, I would be eager to hear uh, what other folks would say. I, one practice I learned from Pema Chodron that I really enjoyed, um, you know, we often think of this practice. So bodhicitta, uh, very aligned with our Tonglen practice of compassion, right? And one thing that Pema points out is our Tonglen practice it doesn't have to be just um, receiving what is difficult and transforming it. We can also receive what is beautiful and offer it. So sometimes I'll get in the habit of, you know, um, 
when you're when I'm outside and I feel the beautiful sunlight or I get to see a beautiful sunset, I can also offer that. Right. So there's a way to make even that sense of natural experiencing of beauty a practice that is kind of also aligned. Yeah. Thanks, Ramit. Nice to have you here. Anyone else? How are you cultivating your bodhicitta? How are you making it feel alive at the relative level? We, in um, some of the other books we read together as a group, Sukhni Rinpoche has this beautiful distinction um, around relative and ultimate bodhicitta. Ultimate bodhicitta, almost overwhelmingly crushing how hard it is to wish that all beings would be free. Relative bodhicitta, almost possible, maybe, right? Like, can we extend that to our daily relative life circumstances? And I think being creative with that's really, um, yeah, it's a really interesting task. Yes, Jimmy, you're still muted though. We want to hear you. There I am. I really liked your, um, the encouragement, <clears throat> excuse me, you gave us before we started sitting uh, um, about looking at our daily challenges. Mm. Like, can I, tomorrow I'm going to stop being judgmental or tomorrow I'm going to stop thinking about food all the time <laughs> or tomorrow I'm going to, you, you know, all, all that stuff. And that is really the challenge for me these days is to um, remain dedicated to not going after all of those sensual pleasures, food, entertainment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, mm. et cetera. And to, and to, to really remember um, this path and how much more satisfying it actually is mm. to be able to focus on our breath, to let all that other stuff just sort of be in its natural place and to be able to appreciate the present moment mm. in a real kind of friendly sort of way, just greet it and, mm. and be with it. And that, mm. that suggestion you just gave us about offering the beauty that we encounter as part of our Tonglen practice, that's, that's like, that's really great. Mm. I mean, I, I, you know, I live three blocks from the beach, so I get to see beauty every day, you know, and last night's sunset was overwhelming and I got to see it from being in the water three blocks from my house so it was just like this and so I you know and, and I as I was walking back I was like everybody I got within a few feet of I would say look at check it out it's <laughs> gorgeous and everybody was like yeah it really is and you know it was the whole beach was just totally stoked because yeah. it was gorgeous. So thanks for that reminder. Because hmm. it's easy for me to get lost in here. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jimmy. Nice to see you. Yeah, it's <laughs> nice to nice to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I, I like what you point out, which is um ideally, hopefully, there was a couple moments in that practice, um, or maybe longer, where it felt good. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And, you know, really kind of reconnecting to that subtle or that um, simple goodness of our own breath. It is, it's a really powerful reminder. And, you know, the offering, offering up of goodness means that we don't, we don't have to just choose one or the other. I think many of us have probably experienced that vacillation between I'm just only interested in the outside world and I'm doing all the work stuff and the fun stuff and the people stuff, or, or I'm meditating and I'm serious and I'm focused, right? And we, we need flexibility, all of us here, right? We, we live in this world and that doesn't mean that we are second class practitioners, right? There's many, many, many wonderful accomplished um, 
teachers and yogis who uh, really find that this practice of being in the world really sharpens our blade, really helps with our wisdom and compassion. Yeah. And Diane shares that uh, Jimmy reminded her that part of practice is to notice and acknowledge small blessings and offer them up. Like may all beings have such cozy socks and be able to wash their clothes so conveniently. Yes, I love that. Yeah, Pema, I, which I really appreciate in the, um, when I was reading about this practice, she said it was offering up her cup of coffee, which I like that I only have to do in theory. Um, <laughs> if it was in reality, it'd be a lot harder. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts? We are, we are going to do a slogan tonight. I know we've um, spent a lot of time on the breath, but we are going to do a slogan. So, oh, is that gnome? Hand up? Yeah. Yay. Okay. Yeah. Um, something that just kind of started happening organically for me, which is, sounds like the opposite of what Jimmy is talking about, but it's really not, is uh, paying attention to um, what, what, how I'm being hard on myself, like mm. in, in little moments throughout the day. And it, it just started, I don't know, it just started happening. And now it's something I remind myself, you know, how sometimes you remind yourself, like if you're at the computer to stop and, you know, check your shoulders or something. It's just something that it'll suddenly, I'll suddenly notice doing some mundane tasks that there's a part of me that's really like, oh, like tense. Mm. There's a bodily tension to it. And it's just me like trying really hard. And then I'm like, trying really hard to do what <laughs> just be right here this is what you're doing that's enough you know and so there's a like this subtle way that i'm being hard on myself all the mm. time mm. and um it's really been interesting i think my first the first time after i started meditating that i really had this like kind of light bulb moment was uh the the oh i'm going around judging everyone all the time like all the time and it was just really like overwhelming but it was judging other people and now i feel like i'm getting this more subtle sense of how yeah. i'm always judging myself and i see so much the symmetry between those like they're no different than each other really it's the same it's the same movement just sometimes it's internal and sometimes it's external beautiful yeah that's a, a perfect example of this, you know, really subtle noticing as we do of the breath that we can apply to these other parts of our life, right? Because it, it's amazing to notice the breath. It really is. And it doesn't just stop there, right? Like that subtlety of noticing means that we notice our mind moving towards judgment, towards ourselves or towards others. Like it really, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And I, I sometimes feel like we can actually direct our breath right into those kind of contracted places too. Um, yeah, wonderful. Okay, so for those of you who are um, maybe coming this evening for the first time, we are making our way through 59 slogans of mind training. And this is a classic teaching of the Lojong and we are uh, on number 27, woohoo! And I wanted to, um, is it 27 or 26? I, I have the right slogan, but I didn't put the number. The one tonight is, um, don't wait in ambush, <laughs> uh, which I will go into, but I wanted to kind of remind us <clears throat> of the overarching structure of the slogans. It's, it's, I think, really worthwhile that um, there are 59 slogans, but they are falling under kind of seven main points. And we're already at the sixth point. And so if you've been coming this whole time, this will be a, ref a refresher for you. And if this is your first time, <clears throat> you get a bit of the flavor. The first, and these, these slogans, essentially, they are intended to be these interesting provocations that we can kind of use to, as it's, I love the term, turn our mind. 
doesn't mean change your mind, doesn't mean shift, right? It's just to turn the mind, almost to see in a different way. There are ways that we get to kind of reappraise or reframe our experience and what's happening. And point number one is all of these preliminaries, these preliminaries that essentially remind us about mortality and karma. And that point one, I, a number of times, I, I've, I've started our evening just focusing on those, going back to those, going back to those. Every time we go back to this reality of suffering, of death, of karma, it helps with our motivation. It's a different kind of motivation than bodhicitta, right? It can feel a bit harsher, but it's so important for us to keep those in mind. The second point of the mind training is really kind of what is the main practice? And that is training in our bodhicitta. And just as one reminder slogan, regard all dharmas as dreams. Although experiences may seem solid, they are passing memories. So that second slogan, it kind of helps us focus on what really matters. And that means being of service and connected to others. <clears throat> and this idea that our circumstances and experiences, which may seem solid, often they are not. <laughs> often like dreams, they're happening to us and it seems as though they're fixed and solid, but actually there are projection and perceptions. I had an amazing dream the other night. It was so vivid. I was on the top of a cliff and I looked down and I became so scared that I was hugging the earth. And it was so interesting to me when I woke up and I thought, wow, gosh, it felt completely real. I remember what it felt like to hug the earth, right? And my own fear, like, God, I'm too close to the edge of this cliff. And often that's when we can look at our life and see where am I dreaming in that way? Like, God, my job is the worst or I am the worst or um, this situation is terrible and will never end. It's like being on that cliff, right? No perspective. Not to say there aren't things in life that are difficult and terrible, but how do we start to kind of see the illusory nature of certain things so we can focus more on that which matters, training in our bodhicitta. In point three, my favorite point, um, it's the transformation of bad circumstances into the way of enlightenment. So many of us know this slogan. Even if you don't know the Lojong, you might have heard, turn all adversity into the path. None of these slogans are easy. This one is very hard, but it's so encouraging. Such a message of resilience, of learning, and of acceptance, right? Here, here are life's teachings. As um, a beautiful teacher, Jennifer Wellwood often says, uh, this is life's curriculum for us, right? This is how we're going to learn, just as it is. Point four is showing the utilization of practice in one's whole life. So in this, uh, again, one slogan from this one is about um, how do we kind of understand what our strengths are and how to use them every single day in our life. The termination, familiarization, reproach and aspiration. So on point five, we finally get actually to mind training. And in this one slogan from that is that all dharmas agree at one point that all Buddhist teachings are about lessening the ego and lessening self-absorption. And not because that's the right thing to do, like, oh yeah, I should be less egoic and care for others, but because that's the path of freedom. It's not to renunciate just for the sake of renunciation. It's to renunciate because we start to see more clearly when we regard our all dharmas as dreams, how miserable it is to be attached to our fixed sense of self, to kind of parade this identity project of who we are through the world. It's exhausting. How do we give ourselves some freedom, right? And now we are on point six, which is in the disciplines of mind training. <laughs> so some of you may remember the last time um, I taught, the last slogan we did was around gossip. That was very juicy. And we found that there are, of course, many ways in which gossip uh, can be harmful, 
Though, of course, there is gossip that is incredibly useful that we know from evolutionary psychology. Um, what was the one on the ego? Oh, it's, uh, let's see. There's actually, there's um, seven whole points on the ego. So that would be point, um, slogan 17 through 22, I think, are all about um, the ego. But let's see here. The one I said was, all dharmas agree at one point, lessening the ego and lessening self-absorption. Um, Maybe if anyone has the slogans up, that one's 19. You could put it, the ones around it into the chat. But this current one here, oh, there we go. Thank you, Diane. Don't wait in ambush. <laughs> um, it didn't make a lot of sense to me the first time I heard this, this slogan. Essentially, it's actually, it's, it's kind of nuanced. So the last slogan was around the pitfalls of gossip, right? And the ways that we can inadvertently thwart our practice because we are so caught up in speaking poorly about others. But don't wait in ambush. This one's really specific. It's when someone has caused us difficulty or trouble, someone has wronged us or harmed us in some way. And that we kind of never really let go of that. We've kept a grudge. And then at some point, this person is like failing or weak. And we take that opportunity to assert our rightness in the situation, to exact our favorite revenge. Um, and I, I think it's really interesting um, in you know thinking about, well, that you know, I'm not that kind of person. I don't sit around and, and kind of plot my revenge. But I, I think it's it's kind of interesting to like get really specific and consider when might we have done this or how might we actually be engaging in this kind of activity. So this idea of <clears throat> don't wait in ambush, we can think of this very easily with, of course, the people closest to us in our life who we're maybe living with or see on a regular basis. And we keep this kind of catalog of the things they do that are unideal. <laughs> the ways that we kind of think like, God, I can't believe they do it like that. And what is their problem? And, but it's, it's something that we're maybe unaware that we're holding on to. It's kind of building up that sense of resentment. And then that moment occurs when we kind of get to exact our revenge and let them know, I knew you wouldn't succeed at that. I told you, remember this and remember that. So that's the don't wait in ambush. That's the invitation for us to not kind of hold those grudges and resentments that end up kind of popping up at these inopportune moments. And we really get down on someone about them. Right. Well, it suggests hierarchy position in the herd or tribe. And I imagine, Walt, you're suggesting that those, those are people for whom we can hold a lot of grudges. Yeah, yeah. There, you know, it's interesting. There's quite a lot of literature on stress physiology as a result of hierarchy. And so which, which of us feel the most stress? And you would imagine that people who have less power have more, have more stress. And that is true at a certain level, but there's also um, quite a bit of stress at the kind of mid-manager level <laughs> that we actually have, you know, the hierarchy, it's not just you're at the top and you have less stress and then it increases as you go down. And I, I think it's interesting you bring up this idea of um, kind of hierarchies or bureaucracies or workplaces. And, you know, the more people that you are overseeing or managing, the more prominent you are, yeah, the more people around you are kind of keeping score, right? Did they, did they do it like, why do they do it like that? What's wrong with them? Um, and uh, being a manager of others, it's quite stressful. You actually have a sense that, yeah, everyone maybe kind of is waiting in ambush for you. They can't wait till you get, you know, called out or put down and they're just gonna, you know, 
dance on your gravestone when you are <laughs> when you are out of there. Um, and this gets back to you know a theme that pops up a lot in the course of the Lojong, and I'd say a lot in the course of um, trying to understand it are defiled or difficult emotions, and that's contempt, right? And I um, I maybe will never tire of contempt because I think it's such a, a important and difficult emotion for us to overcome. Contempt is really at the seat of our judgment and contempt is that feeling of superiority that we know better. And maybe we even do, but when we feel contempt, it gets in the way of our compassion. So what would be a different way than waiting in ambush, <laughs> right? What's our alternative? What's our other move? When we are, we'll give you even the benefit of the doubt here that you're waiting in ambush because what this other person or character did was indeed wrong. It was wrong. What are other ways that we can respond to this kind of uh, inappropriate or possibly even challenging or maybe even harmful act? How do we avoid that kind of waiting in ambush? Does this ring a bell for anyone? Does anyone have a waiting in ambush example? Yeah, I do. Okay. <laughs> um, when one of my housemates leaves their stuff in the dryer or the washing machine and like for days maybe and um, and then I go to do the laundry and I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to take this stuff out. I got, you know, and sometimes I fold it and, you know, and it's, you know, and it's like, that I'm like, yeah, motherfucker, he does this all the time. Well, you know, come on, man. <laughs> it's so petty. But it, it's strong. strong. It can yeah. be strong. Yeah. 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 So as a, as a practitioner, you know, what, what would be in an ideal world? What would be the response to this? Because let's be real, this is not going to change. <laughs> <laughs> no, to just the, the, the response is just with, with kindness. Yeah. Remove the stuff, do what I have to do. And then in a, in a kind and thoughtful way, and this is actually how it usually goes, I let him know you left your stuff in the dryer, you know? And he's like, oh yeah, I know, I'm really sorry. I do it all the time, but you know, so it's just this, and if I could do that, which I do, but if I could do it without having to make this mm -hmm. shift from being mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. first, yeah. if I could just do it without that initial clench and judgment and, that that block to my compassion yeah that block to because you know this is somebody i love <laughs> this is a friend that i've known for years mm -hmm. who has been yeah you know, a good good friend to me yeah and it's so petty yeah <laughs> It's a larger scheme of things. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, but that's a perfect example, right? Because we always we want to um, think of these kind of huge and monumental experiences. And those are those are really hard to work with. Um, you know, those are not only hopefully somewhat rare, but it really is in the day to day. Uh, and that example, it's just it's so it's so classic. And I like what you pointed out, which is you it kindness comes but you wish you didn't have to get through the kind of the charge you know yeah. that kind of um embodied feeling which yeah the more um the more we connect to our practice the more kind of disruptive it is when we experience that charge of anger um, and and physiologically right it is it has an impact on us and it's kind of draining even if we overcome it. So what's, you know, how do we, and so, right, like in this case, which is so interesting, you have a really good sense of kind of the location of this trigger that will happen. 
So it's almost like, how do you start practicing as you make your way to the laundry area? <laughs> you know, and preemptively be like taking on that bodhisattva warrior and say, my training ground is here. I accept this challenge, right? And bring out the Dharma sword and get ready to face the frustration <laughs> that will meet you. And, you know, because again, it's just your motivation is, is beautiful. Like I want to, I want to get to kindness quicker. And so kind of treating it with that level of, um, you know, seriousness, really that kind of warrior path. It is, it's so hard, those small um, things. And the ambush would be right. If you, the day that he left stuff in the washer so long, it got moldy that you would then be like, see, this is, a, and like be delighted. That would be the wait and ambush move. <laughs> you know, had to throw out all these clothes because there's just like, couldn't get that smell of mold out from being the washer. But yeah, no, thank you for that example. It's a perfect one. And I hope, I think it's really great, again, when we have these known triggers that we, they're gonna happen, that we get to like really think about what are the ways I rehearse or prepare and start to kind of slightly um, experiment with these different approaches. So let us know how it goes. <laughs> yes, Claudia, nice to see you. Hi, likewise. Yeah, I just uh, realized how much, and I'm really thankful to you, Eve, and the CEB course that I took because I realized how much I have grown. I just recently had a, a challenging situation with a family member, and uh, I was insulted. And, uh, but you know, knowing these family members, history and background, I think it really helped me to be able to be more compassionate, mm -hmm. to acknowledge my responsibility, because it takes two to tango, obviously, you know, um, and it actually had something to do with something you said last week, I think about uh, thinking about our motivation when giving, right, being really, really mindful about what is our intention? So I, I acknowledge my part, but um, I'm so happy to see that now I can have compassion and kindness and respond with, you know, I really, I will do tongling for you mm. because I really want, I mean, I really wish that you heal things from the past mm. that are obviously still hurting you know and of course the causes of suffering and our attachment to things or people in any way so I I'm just uh, very happy that little by little I'm like you know being able to handle some of those challenges in everyday life I am so glad to hear that and yeah I think it's it's very hard to apply Tonglen when it is a, a family member mm -hmm. <laughs> and be someone like, as you said, like you were offended, you know, that, that is so strong. Like there's, there's, you know, that experience of being unjustly accused or um, it has such a powerful and potent um, resonance for us. And to be able to, in the face of that actually find spaces quite impressive. You should be, you should be happy with yourself. And with the Tonglen, I'd be curious, did you do it like on the spot or later, um, like hours or days after? Or how did you work with uh, that? Uh, days after, days after. Uh, it took me a while to kind of like process, you know? Yeah. But the other thing that has helped me a lot is like when you taught us, when we were studying, like, what was that? Uh, bright mind, bright heart or... Uh-huh. Open mind, open heart. Yeah. Open mind, open heart. Yeah. Thinking about how we're not a solid entity and we're constantly changing and the impermanence, all those concepts, everything kind of like coalesced, you know, to make me realize we got to give each other 
a chance. We're always yeah. changing. And uh, I mean, if we hurt others, it's because yeah. we get hurt as yes. well. You know? That's so, so right. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Eve, because I've learned so much from you. Mm -hmm. and, I'm so thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And and you remind me, you know, of um, how I've seen the practices to it in my life as well. I, you know, I, I absolutely, this don't wait at ambush, it feels very familiar to me, happily, not recently, but this feeling of being wronged, right? You know, you meet someone and I'm, I was trying to remember, I can't remember this person exactly, but a dear friend of mine was had a new girlfriend and I met them for the first time and felt that they were disrespectful to me and kind of put me down. And I held that so strongly, you know, it just felt so offended and no idea was going on with them, probably many things. And when I found out they broke up, I was like, yes, 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 yes. I was so happy, just like, come on, you know? And um, really, I think, um, I don't remember if this actually happened or I imagined or it was in a dream, but, um, thinking of like running into that person years later, right? And who who they are now, of course, so different than, I'm happy to say that was in my twenties, happy, like so different than whoever they were um, at that point. Gosh, it's just amazing. And especially if we run into someone and we don't know them well, and we have just this one impression and they might be having a terrible day. They might just be having indigestion, right? <laughs> like it can really <laughs> impact. Yeah. Our, our engagement and to have that, you know, fixed sense of that's who that person is and it's against me, such a trap, you know? And at and first I, I have to admit, you know, I was, I mean, it was like ringing the words, you know, I just I couldn't let go. Yeah. But I decided I was tempted to respond or react and I, no, you know, and I just, I really, uh, I'm so glad that I didn't get yeah. hooked into that, you know, yeah. Uh, it, yeah, I'm so glad. And then that I felt later on that, yeah. you know, understanding and, and working on, on that, yeah. ki that kindness and, and compassion. Hmm. Yeah, that's an inspiration with family members, especially. Wow, I'm impressed. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, um, you know, one, one thing of this slogan, I really appreciated, um, Diane shared the link and in one of the, one of those descriptions and kind of reflections on the Lojong practice, there's a real invitation for us to not just wait for our resentment to rise, but kind of investigate where are you holding resentments? Where are you waiting to ambush? And is there some room to start practicing Tonglen, to start ventilating a bit? I think for most of us, we have a sense of you know, maybe those people who we're fortunate to not see or engage with on a regular basis. But if we had to, there might be some of that resentment just ready in the wait. And what can we do? What can we do so that we don't kind of leave ourselves susceptible to that? Um, yeah, essentially a desire to see someone fail and suffer and to have that kind of sense of joy when they do. Um, so I think it's, it's a really, um, yeah, it's an interesting task, this slogan, really investigating and finding where we're stuck. And it has to be, um, which I think, you know, Claudia, you really um, highlight here, it has to be first recognizing our own hurt. So not rushing too quickly to, to say, oh, I forgive them. I want to be compassionate, but no, that hurt. There was harm, there was challenge there, but not to let it get to the point of this, I can't wait till they fail. <laughs> They're gonna fail, right? And, and often, you know, with people who are um, acting in ways that make us feel a lot of resentment, they probably or often can be acting quite unskillfully. So they might fail. Um, yes, Walt points out schadenfreude, this wonderful word, the delight in the uh, downfall of someone we don't like or our enemies. And it's interesting, it's one of our enjoyable emotions that is unwholesome. 
It doesn't cultivate wholesome mind states. Feels good. Feels really good. Um, and yet it really, it, it, does, it doesn't really get us to the freedom we're looking for. And I think especially, you know, if we bring karma in here, our desire to see someone else fall and fail seems as though very likely we will find ourselves falling and failing and being and someone having a party about it around us, right? Like, so just really seeing that kind of interchangeability as well. Like we are all gonna make mistakes and fail. Be terrible to have folks around us rejoicing in that and the cause and conditions that create that, you know, so. <sighs> Another Lojong slogan with an unbelievably high aspiration. So let's give ourselves a couple minutes here to come back to practice. And reconnect to our breath. Maybe notice any subtle shifts or changes in how our breath feels now. Returning to this aspiration of bodhicitta. And remembering that our aspiration that all beings be safe and free and with ease includes us. And taking a moment here to tend to our own hearts. really planting the seed of care, to care about our own well-being, our own suffering, our own liberation and freedom. With our next breaths, really drawing in this heartfelt aspiration and care. That we could know the causes and conditions of happiness. That we could diminish the causes and conditions of our suffering and challenge. And that we could be of service and show up for this world that needs us so much to show up. And putting our palms together in front of our heart, if that's comfortable, kind of sealing in and dedicating our aspiration and intention for this practice. May all beings be free. May all beings be safe. May all beings know ease. Thank you all. Really a delight to be here. Um, Chandra and I will be together next week. Woohoo! Double Dakini trouble. Moving on to our next slogan. And uh, yeah, just a real good a real trouble. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> good trouble indeed. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ian.